Hi, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Queer Joy panel uh, that is part of the Small Press Expo programming this year, 2021. I am joined by a murderer's row of talent. Um, starting, um, <laughs> starting with uh, Crystal Frazier. Hi. Emma Jane. Hello. And Walter Scott. Hello. And we are here ostensibly to talk about queer joy in comics, but I suspect the conversation will also um, wander a little bit. What I'd like to do first, this is like the classic moderator trick, is I would like each of you in turn to briefly describe your work as if there are people in the audience who are not familiar with it, starting with you, Crystal, please. Uh, hi, I'm Crystal Frazier. Uh, I am a game writer, comics writer, prose writer. Uh, I worked on the Pathfinder role-playing game for a while. I helped make it very gay five or 10 years back. Uh, and these days I'm writing comics that I am also trying to make very gay. My most recent book uh, it revolves around a very neurotic, anxious trans girl falling in love with her teammate on the cheerleading squad. And most of my writing involves anxious trans girls. I don't know where that pattern keeps coming from. Yeah, that's yeah, very, say. very hmm. weird. Um, well, uh, our next uh, panelist is someone who knows nothing about anxious trans girls. Emma Jane, would you please describe your work? Wow, brutal. Um, hi, I'm Emma Jane. <laughs> um, I am the writer slash artist of probably most famously trans girls hit the town and last year trans girls hit the field those titles alone are basically enough to tell you whether or not you want to read those comics or not and, and that was kind of the goal but um yeah that stuff is more slice of life um stories about trans women in community and just living their lives and then walter yeah, so my name is Walter Scott, and I mainly do um, an ongoing graphic novel series called Wendy, which is a satire of the contemporary art world, starring Wendy, um, an anxious young artist, um, and we follow her through her misadventures, and she is surrounded by uh, a crew of like various diverse sort of like personalities and friends, uh, and frenemies, of course, uh, so that's what I do. Cool. Um, so now that we have like sort of that baseline established, I want to jump in with the first question. These are not meant to be like everyone answers in turn necessarily. Please like just treat this more conversationally, but obviously stop me or, you know, whatever, if you have more to say or, or anything like that. Um, how important is it to you to depict um, like, happy moments in queer life and queer community, like specifically and intentionally. Um, and I'll direct that question at Walter first. Uh, I don't. <laughs> That's why I directed it at you first. <laughs> yeah, I see what you did there. Um, well, I think maybe because um, I'm not really out here trying to make like a rosy picture about things per se. like. If we're going to talk about queer subjectivity specifically, um, Wendy has a friend named Screamo, and he's a character that's designed like the Scream face, you know, a little bit like the movie Scream, but also Edward, Edward Munch's Scream. So he represents like a certain kind of like uh, anxiety. Um, he's extremely emotionally out of touch with himself. So you're watching him sort of enact all of these gay traumas. Uh, but it's a like it's funnier than it sounds hopefully like he actually <laughs> like you you see him like hook up and like steal medication from one of his hookups who like was racist to him like it's just like it's hilarious is what i'm saying um but um you kind of watch him like slowly start to understand something about himself through these sort of like experiences so i'm hoping you know to like create something where something good comes out of it or or the character at the very least develops mm -hmm. uh emma yeah so when i think about the reason i 
have moments of joy in my comics, it's probably because it is against every instinct I have to do so. <laughs> um, every single comic I write, the first draft of it in my head ends in tragedy, actually. <laughs> like the first draft of Trans Girls Hit the Field, all three characters just fucking hate each other. <laughs> but um, yeah, I feel like if you read it, you really would not pick up on that. But I do it very selfishly. And I know there are people who have gotten a lot of positive feelings out of my work. And I'm like glad my work has meant things to them, but selfishly I'm doing it as like an almost therapeutic kind of exercise in being like, hey, maybe things will be okay. And I don't need to be, you know, a fucking fatalist all the time. I don't know if I can swear on this. Yeah, well, that ship has sailed. <laughs> um, yeah. Rob, bleep it out. Bleep out the fuck. <laughs> well, now he's got to bleep twice. Uh, and he's going to have to do more. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to buck the trend and say, yeah, it's, it's fairly important for me to include a lot of uh, positivity in at least some of my writing. Some of my writing is very dark, but uh, Cheer Up in particular, my, my queer comic about cheerleaders, uh, the whole point was to write the sort of happy story I needed when I was a scared trans girl in high school, you know, just desperately trying to survive and clinging to any bit of representation I could find. They're just, at the time, they're, they're, I mean, even today, there isn't really a lot of good representation for us that isn't, you know, morality lessons for the cis or, you know, otherwise very dark endings or, you know, stories about triumph against very dark things. So having sort of a light, fluffy, happy story with low stakes and a happy ending kind of felt subversive. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I add something? Of course, uh, please. I feel like for me, queer joy is one thing, but for me, like what feels more important to represent in, in like my work is a queer friendship and like coalition, like, mm -hmm. like uh, queer people coming together or or creating like a community regardless of you know if there's joy pain um anything you know like i think that seems to be more what i'm thinking about yeah i really like that approach a lot because then you so don't what have I'm to hearing... worry about... oh sorry because then you don't have to worry about whether the thing that you're making is like giving like the maximum amount of joy to like make everybody happy you know like i think that's a hard way to write like honest narrative yeah, and I don't necessarily think queer joy means things have to be happy all the time, but I think yeah. it's about that that journey to that moment of, you know, loving yourself, loving your community, loving, you know, the situation you find yourself in. Absolutely. Yeah, when I was writing Trans Girls at the Town, something that I really wanted to try to hit on was the really emotional roller coaster is such a trite phrase but kind of the emotional roller coaster of existing as a trans person in a space where it's the weirdest thing where you can feel like you're a miserable piece of trash at one moment mm -hmm. and then mo moment feel like you're on top of the world and then you know rinse and repeat over and over again <laughs> until you reach the end of the night and hopefully you ended on one of the eyes <laughs> Yeah, you, you can't see one of, I'm wearing one of my very optimistic t-shirts that's just a picture of a screaming possum with be a trash can, not a trash can't. So I definitely relate with that sentiment. <laughs> yes, words to live by. I'm wearing a shirt that says trauma. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, okay, I think there's a lot of, a lot oh, of, go ahead, please. of joy to be found in, you know, survival strategies and sharing them with each other. I mean, it's it's a little bit dark, but I think there's a lot to be said for, again, the way we adapt 
and build something meaningful, you know, build something meaningful out of that shared trauma that most of us have to go through. I mean, it doesn't destroy us forever. We, we come back from it. We find humor in it. We find, you know, community in it. Mm-hmm. So I want to emer- emerge out of the darkness for one second, just to <laughs> mention two things. Number one, swearing is fucking fine. I don't care. Number oh, two, uh, number two, the actual official title of the panel is Queer Joy <laughs> and Queer Friendship. So Walter is, uh, is right on and hitting that. And now I will go away. Now I will go away again. That's not going to work because my queer friendship ended up in queer in queer smooching. So yeah, the title of the panel, I guess, is not Queer Joy versus Queer Friendship. Yeah. No, that's that is what it is actually. The official oh, yeah. title of the panel. <laughs> All right, queer joy versus queer friendship. Fight. So it sounds like we have like um an interesting sort of bridge between this idea of writing stories that feel aspirational mm-hmm. and stories that feel grounded and like reflecting a type of like trauma that is real in queer experience, but also showing sort of like the growth that can come out of that. Um, Something that I wanted to ask was, if we're talking about like aspirational queer stories, are there stories that have like particularly affected you by other creators that like you think of? Um, And obviously I don't necessarily just mean like super happy aspirational i'm talking like very broadly here but is there something that you think of when you're like working and you're like ah you know that that like makes me feel good in a way that i want to capture in my own work i've always got tons of great less horror (laughs) i always have tons of great examples once the panel is over and every time somebody asks me this on the spot i'm like i don't know would it I, help I, if I said, <laughs> well, thank you everyone for coming to the panel. This was a really productive discussion. Oh. Uh, Girl Haven by Lila Sturges. It's a young adult, like coming of age book, uh, you know, portal fantasy where modern teenagers find themselves in a fantastical realm. It was absolutely delightful. And I hope I can write something, you know, that touching at some point in my career. I don't I feel like it's very basic but I do think about dykes to watch out for a lot and I think that might just be because I too am quite neurotic (laughs) but I don't know. I think that was probably the first time I read something where it was just like, wow, I think it might be the first thing I read where it was just queer people talking to one another and this idea of a greater community. I'm pretty sure in um, one of the forewords to the collection I have, I think um, Alison Bechtel does talk about it be more like aspirational that all of these lesbians happen to be in the same place and they're living not really a utopic life. Is utopic a word? We'll go with it. Sure. (laughs) But yeah, it's aspirational in that sense. And weirdly enough, I feel like I've sort of stumbled ass backwards into it, except with trans people. And that's been really good. Yeah, I feel like I have never read a book in my life because I can't think of a single one. But I do agree that um, Dykes to Watch Out For is an ongoing inspiration for me because it's like a really well-carved out ongoing soap opera of just people's, the mundane quality of like people's lives, which I actually think is radical in a sense. And in my work, like there are queer people who are like, have complicated lives, but there's a mundane aspect to it that I want to try to maintain that like, there is no need to like, um, uh, sensationalize 
um, the realities of, say, like a sex worker more than really necessary because, you know, it usually just benefits like people who already have a preconceived idea that that kind of lifestyle is crazy or whatever. Um, so yeah, like I do appreciate the like super lens, close up lens on like the very mundane qualities of the the girls and dykes to watch out for. And I try to maintain that sense of, of like keeping close and looking closely and not like judging too much or creating a space where we all have to like, you know, be shocked. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And then on the, the flip side, is there like an example of like super dark confrontational queer work that you're frequently thinking about when you're creating? I feel like this should be an easier question. <laughs> it would be for me, but. I'm also, if you hate looking. these questions, you don't, you don't have to answer them. <laughs> I'm desperately looking at my bookshelves as you're asking <laughs> questions. You might have just have to skip me on that one. As you're thinking, like I could, I could give an example of something I'm thinking of. Like, have any of you read Hothead Paisan? Um, it's a classic um, lesbian comic by Diane DeMassa um, about, it's called Hothead Paisan Homicidal Lesbian Terrorist. And it's like, just this like extended revenge fantasy work about a dyke who kills street harassers and rapists and child abusers and like just without any obstacle or anything, like she takes revenge. And I really like that work because I think it's like dark and powerful and like optimistic in its own way because it's like this, this very like cathartic kind of like escapism um, that is very specific to a type of queer experience. That's fair. I tend to avoid media like that just because my own transition was earmarked with a lot of violence. Mm. So I tend to avoid I don't tend to avoid angrier works because they're honest and raw, but more because they can bring out that part of me that I don't necessarily like or need to embrace anymore. That's super fair. Now you're reminding me that I was introduced uh, not that long ago to Roberta Gregory's Bitchy Butch, The World's Angriest Dyke. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. And I was like, how? I've not seen this. You have not seen this? I'll put the link in the chat. Um, and when I saw it, I was like, how have I not seen this? But like, the the art style is really like frenetic and crazy. And like, she's just angry. I don't know, like, the quality of the line work is like angry. <laughs> it's really mm -hmm. funny. So I'll just, that that'll be my contribution. Yeah, definitely some recency bias here. I've also been reading um, the book Her Body and Other Parties by Carmen Machado, I believe mm -hmm. is her name. Oh boy, hope I didn't get that wrong. But um, it's actually not comics, it's pro short stories, but mm -hmm. they're all kind of flirting with horror and who can say usually women, fall ass backwards and just sleeping with one another who can say <laughs> but um that is my experience what what's to be done uh, <laughs> no, but uh something about that work that really grabs me is that it i mean it, it can be difficult to read because it's basically entire stories about violence against women, although a lot of them are more abstracted and metaphorical. Um, but there's just something about those situations where that kind of clinging to a safe intimacy and steadfast steadfastness to another person in a world that is trying to harm you creates this like urgency that I find deeply, deeply romantic. And I do not want to really <laughs> be like, yay, the tragic lesbians trope, but holy hell, does it hit me hard? Oh, do I love that shit? <laughs> um, 
yeah and i don't know i'm kind of working on my first romantic story maybe ever and there's sort of a sense of urgency i want to capture with that even if it's not necessarily a tragedy but just that sense of intensity in an unusual moment in time. Cool. Okay. Um, I will stop asking you book report questions um, <laughs> and instead ask more about your work that you make, which is why we're on this panel, I guess. Um, you said no oh. more book report. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I wanted to get a little bit like more conceptual with the, the question of like queer joy and friendship and ask how much you feel the work that you're currently making reflects your own experience of like queer friendships and whether the work that you're making is like pulling punches, not pulling punches, like going farther than you have experienced, not going as far, et cetera, et cetera. I always feel like I'm pulling punches. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm definitely pulling punches. My Cheer Up was written for a young adult audience. So there's of course. Yeah, a lot of things that I've been through that I wasn't necessarily going to put in a, you know, a happy book about cheerleaders falling in love. Uh, right. But I did draw on my own experiences in terms of like queer friendships and, you know, the ways you sort of absorb bits of the people you meet and use that to overcome your own shortcomings. Like I pulled a lot from my marriage to sort of flesh out the relationship of the, the main characters in in the ways that my wife has helped make me a lot more calm and a lot more measured and a lot more analytical and the way that I've helped her become, you know, more forceful and more, you know, willing to take chances. That's really lovely. <laughs> <laughs> something, something that's important to me to include in my work is friends in conflict, I guess is how I would say it. Um, I, I don't know if I can think of a eloquent way to say it, but just, I don't know. I'm going to be very old man yells at cloud, but the internet, <laughs> I just jostled my entire laptop. <laughs> no, there's just this, um, kind of sense of you screw up once and then all of a sudden yeah. everyone should just abandon you. And boy, that's just a can of worms into an entire different discussion that requires mm -hmm. more time and nuance than we could ever possibly have on this panel. But I just, it breaks my heart and frustrates me when I see a queer community constantly at each other's throats and trying to destroy each other when a whole bunch of people already kind of want to do that. And I really want there to be stories where people fight, mm -hmm. but they're still friends. <clears throat> and I wanted to make it really much nastier than I have, but I don't know. I'm always, a, I don't know if any of you have really struggled with this, but something I think I struggle with is, I don't know if I wanna say morally, but morally how you would justify making really grim and dour work. Not that I think it's immoral, but just like, mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like a productive thing to do, even though I really, really wanna make it. I mean, it sounds like it would help you work something out. And if it's helping you work things out, it would probably help other people work on the same issues. Emma, um, I want to read your grim and dour work. Yeah. Also, Emma, I, 
I'm completely on board with what you're saying about mm -hmm. creating fictions of characters in conflict because I have that same desire for my characters to go through conflict and come out of it without like completely canceling each other's <laughs> existence. Um, and I think sometimes when I write these conflicts, it's the way that I would like, I just want to see an example of it going a certain way and like mm -hmm. putting that out there as like a possibility, you know, I think it'd yeah. be good for people to read a narrative where something doesn't get completely destroyed, you know? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're a community that is almost entirely trauma survivors one way or another. So we yeah. are almost all hyper vigilant all the time, constantly worried about where the next threat or betrayal or hurt will come from. Yeah. So having examples in literature of, you know, situations where an argument came up and it was resolved in a healthy way at the end is really important for our community in particular. Or also like how it wasn't and what mm -hmm. is the emotional like uh, contours of that, you know, like what are mm -hmm. the, yeah. the uh, uh, results or consequences for like ways that people are navigate, navigating conflict these days. And to add to that, like my characters all sort of represent different kinds of like subjectivities. Like Wendy is like mm -hmm. the art girl and Screamo is like the queer person and then Winona is the indigenous artist and like they all have conflict with each other because of those things sometimes or like um I kind of just feel like I'm throwing them into like a, a blender and like it's like let's just see what happens when there are different points of view in the world sort of like hit up against each other because they all are different aspects of myself too so I'm sort of trying to work out how this part of me feels about this thing when this part of me is conflicting and like so it's just a way for me, yeah, to like work things out. You kind of preempted where I was going with, with that last question and into the next one. But something I think about a lot is um, I assume that if you haven't read it, you're all aware of the book Stonebridge Blues by mm -hmm. Leslie Feinberg, um, which is like, I would say largely autobiographical. Um, like I'd call it a fictionalized autobiography, I think is a fair thing. But that book largely takes place in the like, 50s and 60s and 70s and the way that conflicts are handled in the book most of the time is that characters or people will get into conflict with one another and then they'll just sort of stop sharing physical space like someone will withdraw like oh such and such a person stopped coming to the bar for a while or such and such a person stopped coming to my house regularly and that is like how queer community uh, like fights were manifested in sort of this like withdrawal and like you know a lot of secondhand like gossip but like there wasn't the same kind of like 24 7 access to what other people are doing and like constant access to shared virtual spaces and I was very curious about how that shift informs each of your work because obviously mm -hmm. being queer right now is different than it was 30 years ago even. And I think part of the landscape of queerness is the kind of map that we're all navigating in our heads of which of our friends fucking hate each other <laughs> and um, like how to kind of massage those interactions even online so that it doesn't appear that we're favoring one person over another or making someone uncomfortable, et cetera. And I think that's a dynamic that's pretty new and like pretty interesting. So if you can speak to that and like how you kind of approach it in your in your own work or whether you're thinking about it. Yeah. What's weird to me is that I feel like maybe it's more impacted the way I make work more than the actual work itself, where it's like, I will be caught up in kind of microanalyzing every single way someone could possibly interpret one narrative decision I make. I do this. <laughs> yeah, where it's just, 
really leads you to bending over backwards to make things as blatant and just I don't know, as sterile as you can uh -oh. to reduce any ambiguity and I think ultimately kind of leading to more, I don't know, just generic store brand feeling work. And then I try to fight back against that. And then I do it too hard. And then I land somewhere in the middle, I hope. Yeah, but... it's like pandering to feelings that you actually don't know were there or not. And then you find out <laughs> they weren't. And it's like, oh, you, I thought you would have, you as in everybody would have freaked out, but you didn't. But yeah, they... or it's like, well, someone might just hate this for reasons I could not possibly conceive. So might as well let her rip, right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I've, I've done that for sure. I do think that um, I'm trying to embrace mystery more, like the mystery of the narrative, the mystery of the encounter, because otherwise I do feel like sometimes like I'm, I'm like preemptively trying to make it as concise and as like PC as possible. And I'm like, am I even an artist? Like, what am I doing? <laughs> uh, and like, I think that like the answer for me is to embrace mystery and I'll, I'll be more specific in a second. I will just keep saying the word mystery. Um, <laughs> I mean, it is very in mysterious. line with what you are describing. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, in a practical sense, I'm the most benign person on the internet ever. Like, like I have the personality of a school teacher and that's helpful. <laughs> and I save my personality for the people in person who I see who deserve it. Right. Mm -hmm. Like people on the internet don't really deserve, you know, me. Oh my god, they don't deserve. <laughs> <but> like, <laughs> they don't deserve. Oh, Cancelled. <laughs> Good. Uh, <laughs> like it's important to be with people, and I try to place value on like those encounters being the things that I put focus on. But also, mm -hmm. um, like, I feel like there's this thing with the internet where you have to say how you feel about everything that's happening at any given moment and i've decided that like i want to do more of a slow burn like if you want to know how i feel about something or like my hot take on something you're gonna have to wait like three years for the book to come out <laughs> and it like gives the book a weight or like gives me like a place to put something that otherwise i feel like i have friends and acquaintances who seem to just exhaust themselves because for them the medium is just like outrage you know on the internet and and that that has to drain your life force a little bit and so anyway my my solution is to remain a bit mysterious in many different aspects of my life i mean my strategy has just been to completely exhaust myself on the internet and hope that i crumble <laughs> into dust but well i've exhausted like myself enough that. yet I don't like to use the term self-care because I find it's a little bit, you know, like a hashtag on like a pillow or something. But like, I think it is important to like, as queer people, to value our energy and like value our ability to say no, you know. But, but then where do I put the cute pictures of my dog? <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Right. Oh, I guess. No, I, I totally part. agree with you, Walter. Like, this is something I've struggled with, too, mm -hmm. writing mostly um, first person, like, at this point, memoir work about sex and, you know, charged topics. Mm -hmm. I, I've really tried to adopt the, like, put it in writing and not online mm -hmm. mentality because it's just not worth it. You know, it's not worth, like teens who will never ever buy or engage with my work will see my tweets and get very angry at them and there's not like much of a reason for me to be fighting with them or like you know antagonizing them when I can put everything I want to down on a page carefully and intentionally it's a good use of time <laughs> Crystal, did you have like more feelings about the the online aspect of the question? Uh, I mean, 
I honestly feel this is this is probably a great place to leave it with. Yeah. Pulling away from social media is probably healthy and something more of us need to consider. <laughs> you know, to uh, also do an old man screams at cloud moment. <laughs> no, it's good. Um, so the like last major question that I had wanted to ask was about um, use of humor. Um, obviously, there's a great queer tradition of sardonic humor and like dark humor about the kind of circumstances that we find ourselves in. Um, and I was curious about the intentionality, again, of the humor that you're using in your work, like whether you set out to think I'm going to make something that is funny or whether you sort of lean into like absurdity that people will notice if they notice it, but won't if they don't. Kind of lean on humor because unfortunately I can't turn it off. <laughs> I know, I know Carta can probably one of the people who can most testify that I'm just like, a compulsive jackass goofball. Um, it's true. It's the biggest barrier for me to write my grimdark opus is that I will constantly <laughs> undermine myself with the goosemanship. Well, uh, Emma, have you heard of Deadpool? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Junji Ito in person is, again, the biggest freaking goofball, but his his horror comics are, you know, bar none, just amazing. Something I really like about his work is that a lot of them are like almost funny until suddenly mm -hmm. they just aren't. Yeah. Uh, and I don't angle. I don't know if you've read any of his cat diaries, but they're I written have. in the yeah, written in the style of a <laughs> horror comic, but they're just stories about his adorable cats being cute. <gasps> yeah, it's something that always really baffles me about that book is that the Marketing blurb on back is hell, oh kitty, <laughs> because like they it just really feels like they don't know how to market it. It's just I, mean, it's I feel so they weird. know exactly how to market it. <laughs> I don't um, know, but yeah, I mean, humor is a survival survival technique that our community uses a lot. God knows, I use it a lot. It's just it's easier to diffuse tension through making a joke about it than it is to, you know, make a big scene and possibly alienate friends or, you know, estrange your parents or get you know, ruin Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the catharsis of it is really important because mm -hmm. I really distinctly remember reading um, The Pervert by Michelle Perez and Remy Boydell for the first time in the scene where there are two characters in the diner and I forgot exactly how it goes, but one of them jokes about, you know, just cutting off their dick and putting it in a sandwich just so they can finally be done with it. And I'm like, oh good, I'm glad like, I think I've heard every trans woman say some sort of permutation of this, but it's really mm -hmm. great that someone has written it down for posterity. <laughs> uh, there's, um, I think I will categorize it as meat humor <laughs> is particularly something that's right for trans-related media because I don't know, we have such weird relationships with our bodies where it's very easy to treat it as we are this weird piece of meat and we want to make the meat as palatable to ourselves as we can. And I, I think you made a really good point earlier about uh, talking about Junji Ito where his stories are funny up until they're not. And I think it kind of works in the reverse too because for a lot of us dealing with, you know, trauma and horror and other negative things that we've been through is about making things making things that are so absurd they are damaging into things that are so absurd they're funny. And that's just a way of handling situations you, society does not prepare us to handle.
I'll, I'll just say one thing about humor is um, <clears throat> one thing I try to maintain is um, I have to make myself laugh with my drawings. And if I do, then I know I'm on the right track. And so that's it's kind of as simple as that for me. I, I have to be sure that I'm laughing along with my drawings. Yeah. I mean, I did a very serious webcomic that, you know, went into details about surviving rape and, you know, estrangement from your family. And it also made repeated jokes about getting hit in the balls with soccer balls. So... <laughs> I mean, it's a classic for a reason. It's hilarious. Crotch violence humor is classic. I don't know what to tell you people. I think you're biased. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're just biased enough. because you have a crotch. <laughs> <sighs> um, do you have any questions for each other? This is like the lazy substitute teacher man. <laughs> Wow! I, I this, honestly thought he, <laughs> I thought you were going to say, "Well, do you have any questions for me?" Yeah, do you have any questions for me, Cardamonier? I mean, where did you get those amazing glasses? Zenny.com, the trans girl's friend. Um, Check that out. Glasses for under fifteen dollars, usually. <laughs> do we have questions for each other? Oh, right. I was trying to think of questions for Carta. That's stupid. How, how did your first queer relationship, like friendship, go? Like, not your first queer crush. Sorry, I'm hyperventilating. <laughs> <laughs> how did your first queer friendship go? I pushed him in the mud on picture day when we were <laughs> little children. And, like, I come from a Mohawk reservation, so it was like, we wear these special ribbon shirts on picture day and he used to run around and kiss people like on the cheek uh <laughs> he'd be canceled for that today but he was about five at the time maybe six and he ran up and kissed me and i i shoved him into the mud and then his oh. ribbon shirt got ruined oh, and then no. we we both went <gasps> and then i was like, <laughs> Oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> he was like, it's okay. Oh. And he walked away. And that's oh. how and we've been friends for since then. And the rest is history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, I guess based on that story, it, it counts if we didn't know we were queer at first, right? Sure. I guess. The first person I ever kissed, we were like in a straight relationship. And then they broke up with me because they're like, actually, I think I'm a lesbian. And then they moved to Michigan where I wasn't. And then later I was like, surprise, I'm a girl. And I checked in with them and they had cut off their tits. And it's just like, Oh, maybe this would have worked out. <laughs> We're all going to end up sobbing by the end of this panel. Yeah, for oh. real. Yeah, my my best friend in high school was a trans man who was terrified of coming out, but like flittered around me like a moth around a flame, like like was being trans vicariously. I I guess through my experience and which was great because I was scared of everything and his little five foot one butt would, you know, get between me and every major threat he saw coming and, you know, defend me and keep me safe or as safe as he could. It, it meant a lot to me and it, it's one of the few times I did not feel alone in my life. <laughs> That's so sweet. Yeah. I, I've been blessed with some really great queer friends. I'm going to plead the fifth on this question. Oh. I, I don't, I don't have any not sad stories. Oh. That's, mm. that's the card of near promise. I mean, like, ask me a question about something that happened after I turned 25 and maybe, but. <laughs> Look, I, I came out here to have a good time and I feel so attacked right now. <laughs> Oh. 
Yeah, yeah. My, I described my high school and early college life to my therapist, and she's like, you realize that was all trauma, right? I'm like, mm-hmm. no, surely every child goes through this. <laughs> my therapist recently used the phrase, surrounded by death. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. (laughs) One time my therapist asked if I, quote unquote, collected broken birds. (laughs) Like actual birds or? No, people. (laughs) People who are having a rough time. It's okay. (laughs) We're learning a lot about each other. We are. Mm -hmm. So do you diffuse your own trauma by trying to nurture others? Do not, do not try. We don't have to get into this. I don't know. I think I'm just very approachable. That's very, you do seem very approachable. Thank you. I had a horrible time. (laughs) Um. Well, fine, I'll leave. Oh, I meant I meant like in general, in life, not yeah. specifically this, not um, just on this date. No, this has been pleasant and not oh, oh. horrible. <laughs> wow, this has not been horrible. Is one of the nicest things people have ever said about dating me. <laughs> there we go into you know diffusing things through humor again. Hmm. Well, I'm completely bummed out. <laughs> <laughs> Queer oh, joy, baby. Oh, queer joy. All right. I did What's, it. What was the first time you experienced queer joy? Um, instead of answering that, I'm going to recommend something that is actually joyful <laughs> to <laughs> the viewers of this, of this panel. Um, if you would like to see a very sweet documentary about trans boys set in Tokyo, I highly recommend mm-hmm. uh, Shinjuku Boys, which Aww. is... Um, a documentary that was filmed in the late 80s or early 90s about three trans men who work in a host club staffed entirely by trans men. And it's extremely good and sweet um, and thoughtful. And I just very highly recommend it to anybody who's looking for like a feel good piece of queer media where nobody dies. I do frequently look for those. I don't find them a lot, but. Also, where can everyone find your work, please? Oh. I, uh, I know this one. <laughs> uh, you can find Cheer Up over at, uh, I want to say it's onibooks.com or onipublishing.com. Mm-hmm. And then I have other series through uh dynamite and marvel and i mean i i write all over the place i'm I'm kind of a word slut well for me uh you can find my wendy comic series it's published by drawn and quarterly and you could find it at your local bookstore support local (laughs) bookstores i changed my answer (laughs) uh you can find my work digitally at emma hyphen Jane with a Y, like it says on the screen, J A Y N E hyphen comics.com. That's Emma hyphen Jane hyphen comics.com. Uh, <laughs> fuck. You can also get physical copies of some of my books at um, the Discat Press online store, whose URL I do not remember, but Carta probably does. It is discatpress.com. That's the good URL. No, <laughs> or noturfs.online. Oh, that's See, better on. No hyphens yeah. in any of those. Yeah, yeah. No, I I'm good at websites. <laughs>